to the Romans. Lest we forget that this was a letter to a specific group of people, we want to highlight that this is Paul's letter to the Roman Christians, the church in Rome. To a specific people, at a specific time, with unique and specific needs and situations that Paul needed to address, but also full of doctrine and teaching and interpretation of the life of Christ that is not to be confined to the specific situation that they were in. Because he was teaching things about Christ that are timeless. And yet there were some situations that he was addressing that were time-bound, that are in his book. But then there are also timeless things, and that will be obvious to you if you've never read through Romans. Some of the things we'll cover it will be obvious to you what the timeless things are. Why don't you go ahead and turn there in your Bible? <clears throat> And we begin today, we are no longer in the narratives of the Gospels and part two of the Gospels, the book of Acts. We have completed the narratives of Matthew through Acts. There are narrations of stories in the remaining books, but these are primarily teachings that came from letters and they were out of pastoral and apostolic concern for churches and believers. And out of that, we have found... The church has found and affirmed what is sacred and what is timeless in these letters. And so they have long been canonized. Everybody say that your favorite word from this course, canonized. canonized. Yes, and it has nothing to do with big blasting guns on ships. Canonized means the closing of a, of a rule. So <laughs> in case you were kind of picturing that in your mind whenever you said that, I did it first. So... <laughs> I wondered, you know, what's the connection? Uh, we are, uh, today we begin the Pauline epistles. Who can tell us which books are the Pauline epistles? Which one to which one? You get the easy points on where it starts, and that's Romans. Uh, from Romans to Hebrews? Almost. One too late, or one too far. Okay. That's okay. Romans to Philemon are the Pauline epistles. And then we, after that, we will later be in the general epistles, which is Hebrews through Jude. But then we have one more book, and that's the Apocalypse which of Revelation, which we will get to at the end of the semester. So we're beginning the Pauline epistles today, Romans through Philemon. Pauline epistles are looked at by scholars as a separate section in the New Testament from the general epistles, and there's a reason for that. Does anyone know what the difference is, the primary difference between the collection of books or letters that we call the Pauline epistles and those that we call general epistles? What, are the, what is the big distinguishing mark that can be found in those two sets of letters? Pauline epistles and general epistles. This will help you when you're reading them. The Pauline epistles give us the most definitive doctrinal exposition of Christ and the church in all of Scripture. Paul's letters. Say that again. The Pauline epistles. The, most, the Pauline epistles <clears throat> give us the most definitive doctrinal exposition of Christ and the church in all of Scripture. Of scripture. Explanation and interpretation of the life and ministry of Jesus and the meaning and purpose and existence of the church. This is Paul's great work that came out of his epistles as he wrote to people and churches about situations he was concerned about and about impurities that were already infiltrating the baby church, the new church. And out of this we have these definitive doctrinal expositions. The general epistles will be later, Hebrews through Jude, give us the most definitive exhortation of what we do for Christ as the church. How to live 
for Christ. With the, with the Pauline epistles, we find out who we are in Christ and who we are as the church. And in the general epistles, we are exhorted on how to live for Christ and operate in mission together. And they're not, uh, they're not strictly those things. Those are just the main themes. They, they all contain some of each, but that is what their, what their main intent was in writing. And so the canon is organized in that way. It's not just haphazardly or arbitrarily thrown together by the councils that canonized these writings. They were seen for uh, these themes and these purposes, and they were put together, and it's helpful that way. The Book of Romans, one of the most important contributions to the faith within the canon of Scripture. And we will be doing only a review of Romans, obviously, in two classes. We will review uh, in the next, today and Friday, what Elam has an entire course on, the Romans course. And that was one of my favorite courses when I was a student. And it was so challenging and so impacting. So in two days, we're going to look at one of the most important contributions to the faith in all of the canon of Scripture. Now let's look at a couple key verses in Romans that give us the theme. These are key verses. Romans 1.16. Why don't you go ahead and read this with me? Can you see the screen? If you can't, you feel free to stand back there uh, or pull it up in your Bible there. Romans 1.16. Let's read this together. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That is, that is the main theme. Joined with this next two verses here. Key verses. Romans 3, 23 and 24. And we're picking up in the middle of this thought here, but I just wanted to get these two as key verses in Romans. Let's read these together. 3, 23 through 24. <laughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In the words there, the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The two main themes right out of these verses are, right out of 116, is the power of God for salvation and the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. That word redemption, there aren't many words in scriptures that are as loaded and as meaningful and important as the word redemption. Who can share, uh, what do you know about the word redemption? This is an important word that we want to take a moment here and talk about. And it's a theme all through scripture, Matthew. Um, one definition I think a lot of us will uh, understand is the uh, redemption of our suffering. That happens when we go through trials, like trials like Job went through. Mm -hmm. God redeems our our hardships mm -hmm. through a you know deeper uh, relationship with Him and a deeper connection and mm -hmm. a deeper blessing. And what does that mean to redeem? What what is that concept of redeeming? He he takes it and then keeps it or does whatever he wants with it, and then gives something in return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that works well. And that we think of those, uh, that one translation, I think it's Paul that says, redeem the time, to redeem your time that has been lost. And ben, thank you. Mm -hmm. Example, I think of when I, I hear the word redeem is like a pawn shop. And it doesn't mean <laughs> not many people think of, like, what is, how does that apply to like in a pawn shop, you sell, you put something up for, uh, like it's kind of like you're gonna do that as um, as security for like for money that you're gonna do, and then you'll eventually buy it back when you have enough money. And like I think of it as we were we were sold there because of the fall, and that we were we had every um, we belong there because of our sin, you know, and we we were we just we belong to the devil, and our sin brought mm -hmm. us there, but Jesus bought it with his blood and brought us back into his plan and his, and his, uh, and his kingdom like he planned from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. 
Good, thank you. Anyone else? Redemption. Jacob. I think of a prison, like a prisoner being mm -hmm. redeemed, being let free, or even though he's uh, condemned and he's been charged, mm -hmm. he's being let free even though he's guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone posted bond. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to do something yeah. for a person to be redeemed. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, um, this says liberation by the payment of ransom, which is this kind of same idea as not deserving to be free, but someone paid a ransom. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, something has been paid when there's a redemption. Yep. Who has ever heard of the Brownsville Revival in the early 90s, or uh, 1995 through 2000? The Brownsville Revival in Brownsville, Florida outside of Pensacola. Yeah. Brownsville Revival was, uh, was a ministry that happened, was an outpouring of the Spirit that was ignited by the, by the ministry of evangelist Steve Hill. You ever heard of Steve Hill? And he, um, yeah, that was a long time ago now. <laughs> uh, Steve Hill had been touched by the Lord powerfully in the Argentine revivals with Carlos Anapendia. Maybe you've heard of that before. And he, uh, when he was ministering in Brownsville in, in an Assemblies of God church, the Spirit of the Lord fell on that place. And for years, thousands and thousands and upon, really hundreds of thousands of people traveled from around the world to come to these services in Pensacola, Florida. And I got to go to one. <laughs> or maybe it was two. I was so tired of that trip, I can't remember exactly. Um, I did my internship with one of their uh, with one of their team members, my uh, seminary internship, at right at the end of this uh, outpouring, and um, thousands and thousands of of prostitutes and gang members were coming off the streets. Police were bringing instead of taking them to jail or to book them, they were taking them into these services because of what they had heard were ha was happening. And these gang members and prostitutes, gang members were taking off their bandanas and throwing them at the front during the mm. response time at the end and give, be using swear words in their testimonies. And they'd be like, man, this is awesome, bleep, right from the pulpit. And people, whoa. And so it was, it was awesome to see what was happening. And Steve Hill, the evangelist, they saw a pastor in Florida, um, in uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, or yeah, Florida, outside of Dallas, Texas. He's now a pastor in Texas. Uh, he had been radically saved and discipled from being on the uh, on death's door as a drug addict. And his the reason I'm telling you this story is because his testimony. He was uh, he was. He was near the end of his life from the damage that drugs had been doing to him in the state he was in. He was like on the brink of dying because he was so strung out all the time and he was violent. And he was in court. And the judge, it was one of those situations where the judge was just sick of seeing this guy in court. Huh. And in the back of the courtroom was a man who I met, and I'm sorry I cannot remember his name, but he became Steve Hill's spiritual father. In the back of this courtroom, this man stood up when, the, when they were deciding on the sentence, and he said, if you will let me have him, I will take him into our discipleship house, and we will work with him in our program, and his life will be, can be reformed there. And I think he probably said it in faith, his life will be reformed. And the judge, just in exasperation, said, and this was in Foley, Alabama, where Steve Hill lived, which is right by the Gulf of Mexico. Super southern culture down there. Uh, it's a lot warmer this time of year, too. <laughs> Said, basically, oh, okay, take him. Oh, it sounds good enough to me. And he took Steve Hill into his discipleship home. Steve Hill went to near death again, if I remember the story correctly, because of his withdrawal, how badly he went through withdrawal, and began to be discipled in the Lord, in that environment, in that discipleship house, and experienced a call into the ministry, and gave his life to the Lord first, and then found that connection in ministry and served the Lord in that way. And out of his life came what is such an unusual 
kind of a ministry mark in the world. But it's neat to look back and see the story that when he was about to be thrown away in prison for that long, there was somebody who stood up and said, I'll take him. And that is similar to what redemption is. <clears throat> redemption is meaningful to us when we understand the legal situation that we are in in our sin before God. The situation we are in is not a good one when we are in our sin. And the sentence that comes down upon us, which we're going to look at today, is the worst sentence there could be. It's the story that you think of when someone has uh, been accused of something or arrested and they've been taken into court and they're thinking, if I could just, you know, it, it, I think it, maybe he'll go easy on me today. Maybe he'll be light on it. I'll just get a few months, something like that. And that person end up, ends up getting put on them the worst possible sentence that they could get, which is really death itself. And in that kind of a court situation, someone stands up and says, I will take his sentence and I'll pay the price so that he doesn't have to, so that she doesn't have to. And that's what the Lord has done for us in redeeming us. Yeah, Jeremiah. A good example of saying, I'll take his, uh, his sentence is Nelson Mandela while he was in prison. Mm -hmm. He went into an African prison and the guards were beating people in the prison very, very brutally and like mm -hmm. within inches of their life. And uh, every time they came to his cell block, he would stand and he would say, no, take me, don't knock that out. Wow. And he did that until wow. he was almost dead. And then eventually they all stood and said, no, take us. Wow. Don't him go. Wow. Beautiful story. I didn't know that about him. Everything I hear about his story is so moving and touching. Awesome. Taking the place of the punishment we deserve. The word redemption comes from the Greek word ap apolytrosis. Apolytrosis. And again, you don't have to memorize this, but maybe you'll want to. But apolytrosis means, the full meaning there is to buy back what was lost by way of ransom payment. Some of you have said that. And to protect, here, listen to this, and to protect what has been redeemed by setting a safe distance between the redeemed and what had previously enslaved them. Don't you like that second part, too? It's buying something back Buying someone back in this, in this context, in the biblical context, redemption. Buying someone from their previous enslavement and protecting them and setting a distance between them and what previously enslaved them. And in your popular survey book on page 147, you get a look at some of the uh, meanings and other words for redemption. And this is one of the primary ones here, polytrosis. Being bought back and having a, having a distance set between you and what previously enslaved you, aren't you thankful for that? Hallelujah. What the Lord does. And we need to know this. We don't always see this with our eyes, but the power of God at work in us has separated us from the power of sin. Right. And that's uh, jumping ahead here, especially to with what we're going to be focusing on today. That's more of Friday's teaching there. Redemption, apolytrosis. Why don't you look at your... She here, does everybody have this, a thematic structure of Paul's letter to the Romans? And I'm going to put this up online, um, right on the info page. I haven't done that yet, but I will put this on the info page and popularly in case you lose it or um, want to send it to somebody. Uh, this, is my, this is not my original work. I have reworked some things and put some thoughts there and kind of a uh, different, little bit of different categories by blending through my study in Romans, blending several sources, New Bible Commentary, Popular Survey, um, some of the scholarly notes of my own study Bible, and some other places, and put them together here for this. This is a thematic structure of Paul's letter to the Romans. Very quickly, let's look at this. I put this into three 
main sections. Number one is the doctrinal theme of the book of Romans. Everybody have that right here? Anybody need this? Didn't get this? The doctrinal theme of Romans is chapters 1 through 8, after the first 17 verses of chapter 1, which are his greetings. Remember, this is to a group of people at a specific time, and so he's greeting them and saying some initial things. And he sets forth doctrine, section 1. Jump all the way down to section 2. Is the past, present, and future of Israel. That's chapters 9 through 11. What had happened is the Jews had been expelled from Rome. Don't you know that that would change the makeup of the church significantly? The Jews were expelled from Rome, and now we had almost entirely during that time Roman Christians, but then they were, uh, but then they were coming back into Rome and into the Roman church, but the church was dominated by Gentiles. And Paul wanted to make sure that people had a high view of Jews and that they valued them in their midst and that they understood their place in God's choosing because they were kind of an outcast people in the Roman church. And so we get uh, chapters 9 through 11, Paul addressing this with their past so that they know theologically God's view of the Jewish people who they are now, and who they will be in the future in God's plan of redemption. Very important. And then the last one is an ethic of redemption, chapters 12 through 16, which he gives us some practical things on how to live as the redeemed people in Jesus Christ. And you can tell just from this what we're going to focus on in these two days, can't you? <laughs> we're not going to be giving a lot of time to part two and part three. We're going to be focusing on Section 1, A and B, condemnation and then salvation. <laughs> Today we're going to focus on condemnation. Doesn't that sound so encouraging? <laughs> and then on Friday, we will look at salvation. The first eight chapters of Romans bring to us these important doctrinal uh, understandings of who we are outside of God and who we are because of God. We looked at chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And listen to verse 17 here. For the gospel, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And the important thing to understand here, right away in Romans, this is similar to what you found in the gospel sometimes where they're introducing the most important themes and topics right in the beginning, is that it is a righteousness that comes from God, not from me. Not from you, not from what you do, but it's a righteousness that com is coming from God, and it is accessible to us to be transmitted upon us through faith. Did I lose anybody there with that? It's accessible to us. It is God's righteousness, His perfection and His holiness, in the absence of sin, is accessible to us. To the point that it is, can be transmitted to us, upon us. The, the, ultimate, uh, <clears throat> the ultimate satellite power, and that's a cheesy illustration. <laughs> to be transmitted from the throne of God upon you, not by your cleaning up of your actions, although living in righteousness is part of the ethic of being a redeemed person. In the righteousness of God. But because of God's own righteousness made available and open through the cross to be transmitted upon you by faith, to be put upon you in the middle of your sin through faith in Christ. So the cleansing that comes, Paul gives us to this in Romans, and then he explains this all through Romans, he builds upon this, is that the righteousness of God 
is given to us from God himself through faith, so that we are in righteousness, meaning we are made right before God. We are put on the right path, and we are made right with God. We have peace with God. Things are now straightened out before him when it comes to our standing in the presence of God because of it being put upon us by God himself through faith in Christ. And so we get that here right in the beginning. The righteousness that is by faith. And it is a transmission of, transmitted upon us by faith. Let's jump a little bit down here to chapter 3 and look at verses 9 through 20. And this is, we're going to go back to chapter 1 this morning. But I want to get to the end of where we're going to be this morning, which is 3, 9 through 20. The section we're looking at is 1, chapter 1, verses 18. We're picking up now chapter 1, verses 18, all the way through chapters 3, verses 20, <clears throat> on the theme of condemnation. This is, the, uh, this is the situation that we're looking at here. Condemnation. And we want to be thinking about what does this mean? What does it mean to be condemned? What is, what is theological condemnation? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Do you need to think about such a thing? <laughs> and in chapters 1, verses 18, all the way through chapter 3, verses 20, we get the picture of what condemnation in the world is about. And you don't ever want to ever forget this. Paul's teaching on this. And it's because the good news of Jesus Christ is not necessarily good news until you know the bad news first. Are you with me on that one? When you find out how bad things are, the bad news, then the good news becomes really good. And it's really great. Otherwise, it would just be history. It would just be news, you know. Uh, long gone news if we didn't know how bad the situation was. So let's look at chapter 3, verses 9. We're going to pick up here what Paul says about um, the presence of sin in life and in the world. Could I have someone read verses 9 through 20 for me? Who, who's ready to read and, uh, in a good, strong voice? Matthew. 1, 9 through 20. Uh, no, chapter 3. Verses 9 through 20. Let's listen to this and be thinking about the meaning of condemnation. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lisp, lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Thank you. Condemnation. What did you catch there? What are some, there's a lot there. We could spend a few weeks on this section of Scripture. Caleb. Well, what I caught was right at the end was, through the law comes the knowledge of mm -hmm. um, sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the place of the law. Is the law important? Is the Old Testament, is Old Testament law important to what it means to be a Christian? To live in the new relationship that God has made with people through Christ? Is the, what is the place of the Old Testament uh, in the law if Christ has fulfilled it? Why do we need it? Is it applicable anymore? Is there any purpose to it? And we find right there that the law makes us aware of the fact that we're not right with God. It makes us aware of sin. And so we need to understand the law. We need to uh, accept the truth of the law. 
before we start recognizing where we're at before God. When we're out, we're talking about the realm of being outside of Christ, not a, not a follower of Christ. What is the situation for a person who's not a follower of Christ? And I had uh, another hand. Ben? Sanders? No. Vivid imagery here. These words paint a very awful picture that uh, we don't necessarily catch unless we stop here and think about what he is saying and let it come alive in our minds. Um, verse 12, they've all turned away. No one who's done good, not even one. 13, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice disease. The poison of vipers is on their lips. You, it's the picture of this rotting corpse in a casket in the grave, rotting away, uh, and nothing good comes out of that. That's not something that you want to receive from anything. So this horrible, vivid uh, imagery in the violence that is here, the uh, cursing, verse 14, verse 15, violence, shedding of blood, ruin and misery mark their ways. The, the corruption of sin has made it so much that not only are they rotting and dead in their own sins, but they are now going out and doing things to others. Sin causes us to corrupt others and bring corruption into the world. And there's no fear of God in their eyes. So this is not a good picture of the state of people. We are not born with ultimate goodness in us. That is not, the Bible does not teach that goodness is the ultimate mark of where we are at as humans. That is not what the Bible teaches. There is good in people, and people can have compassion, and people can be concerned about one another outside of Christ. But when it comes to those things that are ultimate, standing before God, we are dead in our sins outside of Christ. And we need to always remember this. What, is, what does it mean uh, what does condemnation mean? Let's look at this word here. The word condemnation. Before we uh, look at these three chapters as a whole, the word condemnation is a declaration to be declared reprehensible. Wrong. Evil. And this is usually done after evidence has been weighed. Condemnation in legal terms. After the evidence has been weighed in a court of law, the declaration is made that the person is wrong, They're, what they have done is reprehensible, they are evil, and the court does not hold itself in reservation once this declaration has been made, when a person is condemned. Condemnation, to condemn, is to pronounce guilty. This is the legal definition, these are legal definitions of condemnation. To pronounce guilty, to convict, to sentence, and to doom. This is the picture Paul gives us of the trial and the court situation before God that we are in, in our sins. And when we survey these three chapters here on condemnation, chapter 1, which we don't have time to look at uh, very much here. Chapter 1, it's bad news for the non-Jew. <coughs> Chapter 1 gives us a picture of uh, what happens when people have been given over to their sin. Do you remember from your reading what's going on in chapter 1? Any of the situation there? People become so given over to their sin, chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, once they have reject, first they reject God. They reject the prophetic revelation of God. This is Paul's teaching in chapter 1. When the rejection of God has been made, they are given over to sin. God releases them, gives them over to their own ways. And in chapter 1, Paul fully affirms the place of the Old Testament in the law. 
God's law in the Old Testament is bearing way upon us in the now. And when we have rejected God, chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, we will be punished. Chapter 1, verses 24 to 27. It's very interesting that this is in Romans chapter 1. God gives a people who reject Him. Eventually, He gives a people or a person over to their sin. And one of the marks, one of the societal marks of a people who have rejected God and have been given over to their sin is the presence of homosexuality in a culture. Very interesting that this is in chapter 1 of Romans. And you thought that that was just a, a, a hot topic um, of today. Paul uses homosexuality in Romans 1 as a mark of a people who God has given over to their sins because of their almost total rejection of Him and His ways. I'm all fired up. And He allows them to lead themselves towards destruction. This is Romans 1. And He continues on in Romans 1, that, uh, verses 28 to 32, He eventually gives them over to a depraved mind. It is no longer just in their actions that they are destroying themselves with sin in which he highlights uh, the sin of homosexuality as just one of the big marks that this has taken place. But he gives them over to a depraved mind. And they, are, they become overrun with wickedness to where their mind is so marked by it, their way of thinking, that they now don't just become those who practice evil themselves, but they promote evil in the lives of others and in their society. This is all the way, uh, verses 28 through 32. And this is the non-Jew that Paul is speaking of. Romans 1, bad news for the non-Jew. Would you say that that's bad news? Yeah. Bad news. yeah. Chapter 2, the surprise. If they may have thought, huh, thank God, we're not Gentiles. <laughs> Chapter 2 is bad news for the Jew because of rejection of Christ. And because of the presence of sin and what the law teaches itself, that sin remains. It's bad news for the Jew. And in case anybody would find some way to put themselves outside of these categories, chapter 3, and we just read it, verses 9 through 20, the whole world stands condemned before God. And that is, not, that is not something that is implied in chapter 3. It is said. Paul says it. The whole world stands condemned before God. Bad news for the whole entire world. This is so uplifting and encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> it's condemnation. With the graphic imagery he gives us in chapter 3, the vivid words, the ugly, awful pictures that we need to let settle in our minds to understand the depravity of humanity. The whole entirety of humanity is in these chapters. No one is exempt. No one escapes. No one is right before God. Nothing can stand up and make a person righteous before God. And all are declared guilty in God's court of sin and judgment. All are guilty. Anybody have a thought there? We'll take a minute. Anybody have some comments or questions? Maybe you don't, you're, you're offended by this message. Yes? I've heard uh, homosexual Christians before would it relate to this because I, I just mentioned it. I'm like, well, what does Romans 1 say about and the part where it says in verse 27 in the same way the men also have any natural relations with women <coughs> and flame to bless one another mm -hmm. they a lot of times argue the case that they were born having a natural relationship with man which obviously doesn't work mm -hmm. That's, they'll, like they'll try and scientifically say right there mess up with their chromosomes and stuff. Right. So yeah. they should have a relationship with them. Yeah. 
When it comes to our any kind of relationship we have with people who are lost in their sin, and in this case, what Paul uses as an example, homosexuality, we don't want to treat them as a cultural category. We want to be careful of that. Because the conversation gets very complex, and they've been told lots of things, and they have been indoctrinated, mm -hmm. especially when they are in churches that uh, support it. Yeah. And so there is a need for a relationship there that is very real with yeah. those people. But we want to acknowledge what the Scripture says yeah. when it looks at it as a category of culture. So it's bad news everywhere, condemnation, until... This is where we're going to go on Friday. It's what I want to leave you with. It's all bad here in the beginning until we get to the righteousness from God Himself. Christ's righteousness that is available to us to be credited to our account with God. Aren't you glad for that? Yes. 3, 20, chapter 3, verse 21 is where it begins. Blessings on you today. I'm back.